people of God. Thanks be to God. Julius Caesar came to Britain in 55 BC, and when he came to the, this was like regarded as the misty reaches of, of the world. This was far north of the center of, of known land, Italy, Spain, that area. And when he came to these misty, strange lands of Britain, he brought with them much that the people had never seen before. Roads that were so well built that we still use them today. Uh, military formations and tactics that changed that has not been seen either. Uh, food from across the, the empire, imports. They, uh, Romans were able to conceive of and execute projects that the likes had just had not been seen. When Rome wanted to control the tribes of Britain, they decided to build a wall. How big of a wall? Let's just build a wall across the entire island. Because if you want to control the entire island, you just build a wall an island wide. And it still stands. Hadrian's Wall, it's still there. If you listen to any history of Rome or any history of Britain, you will hear about these, these things that, Brit, that uh, Rome brought with it to Britain. One thing you will probably not hear about is a particular Roman technology. They brought toilets. Yep. That was one of Rome's gifts to Britain. They brought toilets. Once you have working aqueducts and running water, you might as well use them for something. And so they brought toilets. And it became part of the British way of life. They had toilets when uh, Rome showed up. They installed them in uh, 55 BC, and, and they have them for centuries. And then a letter shows up. A letter shows up that is such an important letter, it has its own name. It's the look to their own defenses letter. In the year 410, Rome is having a hard time defending itself against uh, invading Germans. Romans uh, call them uh, barbarians from Barbaros. That, uh, and you were Barbaroi, you were a barbarian, if you were just anyone who was not Roman, right? So they, they had Germans invading. They were. The, the roads that the Romans had built to get their legions conveniently around the empire were being used against them, as the Germans could use them to get directly to the center of the empire. And so they had to pull back all of their legions, all of their soldiers. They had to pull all their defenses back to preserve Italy. And so they send this letter to Rome, it, the look to your own defenses letter, that said, good luck, we're taking all our soldiers, and we're out of here. And you know what happens when Rome leads with all of its soldiers and all its bureaucracy and all of its supply chain and all of its expert, uh, expertise and all of its plumbers? Right? How long does a toilet work if you can't call a plumber? Ever? Because they all left? Right? It strikes me that there had to have been a moment when like grandma was explaining to her grandchild, like we used to have these things called toilets. And then the Romans left. And the grandchild would be going like, whoa. I mean, like they can't even imagine it because it was such a crazy idea. And, and so that's what happens. Uh, Britain had toilets and then they, they didn't. Right? And, and how long does it take before uh, Britain has toilets again? Uh, I can't pin down the exact date. It's, if you start looking for it in Google, it gets it's hard to figure this out, but if you start looking, you'll find an event in 1858. You, it's called the Great Stink. <laughs> you can't make this up, right? It's called the Great Stink. In 1858, the Queen of Britain wanted to go for a little pleasure trip on the River Thames through London, and uh, she couldn't do it. After five minutes on the river, she had to turn around and go back because it just stunk so bad. And uh, there were three cholera outbreaks that year because of how badly polluted the river was. And uh, that, was the, that was the impetus. When, when the queen can't take her, her boat ride, all of a sudden people start finding money for uh, sewer improvements. And, and so within a decade or two, you start finding references to water closets. And so Britain has toilets again. Uh, and how long did it take from, from the 410 when all the plumbers, the great leaving of the plumbers, till uh, 1858? We're talking about 1,448 years. It's a long time. It is an amusing example of something that is true. Just because humanity built something majestic and wonderful once doesn't mean it will always be so. Right? The Roman Empire once controlled the whole world until it didn't. Britain had toilets until they didn't. Israel had a phenomenal king until they didn't. 
Right? And, and that's what we're reading about in, in, in this uh, out of Isaiah. We're reading about the, the stump of, of David. We're talking about the fall of the Davidic kingship, the fall of the Davidic line. That Israel had a king because they wanted one. They asked for one. Go back to 1 Samuel 8. You'll find this amazing argument that goes on between Samuel, a prophet, and the people. And Samuel is saying, you shouldn't have a king, only God should be your king. And the people are saying, we really want a king to be like the other nations. And Samuel says, if you get a king, this king is going to be a human, just a guy, just like everyone else, and eventually they're going to be tempted to do something stupid. And they're going to want your land, and your crop, and they're going to want your children. And the people said, we want a king. And so they got a king, right? They got a king, and it started out well, right? It starts out pretty decently. You, one false start with, with, with Saul. But so you jump, David is a good king. He is a, a king after God's own heart. And um, he does have some problems, but he repents. He apologizes. He gets straight with God. His son, you know, Solomon's kind of an iffy character. That's a whole other sermon. But it's his grandson who really kind of whiffs. Rehoboam uh, splits the kingdom. And from there, uh, it's really hard to... Uh, the kings, they just, they fall, right? By the time that the prophet Isaiah is bringing the people of Israel this word from God, it is clear that the Davidic kingship was fallen, right? Why did they fall? That's another sermon as well. The short version is sin. They're human. They sin. But the kingship was fallen just as much as if it were a tree that was cut down. Right? And that, that's the image used. Like, tree was cut down. Who here has cut down a tree in your life? Right? Takes a little bit of work. You ever cut down a tree and have it grow back? You were cutting down hedge trees, weren't you? The same thing happened over in Green City. I looked it up. A hedge tree is technically a bush. Right? It is a, related to the mulberry bush. Most trees, when you cut them down... Not those weird hedge things. That was, it's embarrassing to have your sermon completely derail when you ask a question and they have the right answer, right? Other than hedge trees, when you cut a tree down, do they ever grow back? No, right? Once it's, once it's down, it's, it's pretty much dead, right? D-E-D, -D, dead. Right? We want to believe that by our own efforts, we are making a better world for our children and our grandchildren that will, tomorrow will be better than today because of what we have done. But that's not always a given because just because something is great today does not mean it will be great tomorrow. Britain had toilets and I think Britain was less great after they lost toilets, right? Israel had a stable government and a successful line of kings until it didn't. And, and, it reminds me of that refrain from investment commercials. You can probably complete this sentence. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. You've heard that line, I'm sure, right? Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Figuring out how, something like how to make a toilet again is comparatively easy compared to bringing a tree back to life. And what it takes to bring the tree of the stump of Jesse. Jesse is the father of David, the first king, this king of Israel. And so what it takes to bring the tree back to life, the Davidic kingship, the Davidic line, is it takes God getting involved. Uh, that's what this passage shows us in Isaiah. God, we are seeing that God is promising to be involved again, and that there will be new life, and the tree will grow again. There will again be a king of Israel, a king who is wise and strong and understanding and knowledgeable. Right? And the king that is described here that is described as a future king, a king that we are not, uh, we're not there yet, right? Because we, we start reading through and... Um, Reading through this, and the imagery is, is apocalyptic. It's referring to the time down the road, and it talks about how the king will strike with the, the rod of his mouth. That does not mean he's going to get like a, a two-by-four stick in his mouth and start whacking people with it, right? The rod of his mouth is what he says. It's the, this is symbolic language. It's further symbolic language when we start hearing about how the, the wolf will dwell with the lamb, or the lion with the lamb, as it was more commonly heard. The leopard will dwell with the young goat. The nursing child will play in the hole of a cobra, and the small child will put his hand down into the viper's den. 
This is symbolic language used to describe a peace that is not here yet. All right, then it will happen on that day, Isaiah writes. That on that day, again, that's that cue that we're looking down the road to what has not yet happened. On that day, the Lord will again recover for the second time his people. The second time, when was the first time? Exodus, right? The Exodus event, when, when God takes all of his people out of Egypt. And again, the second time, God will raise his hand, will gather the remnant of his people, will gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. And, and so what this is describing is a time when there will be a new king in the Davidic line, and, and that all the people of earth will be, all the people, God's people on earth will be gathered together, and, and that the result will be that there will be peace. Right, this amazing peace to which we are, our, our fate, our, that's to what we're journeying. And, and if he, for Isaiah to lay out exactly what, how important this peace is, how transformative it is, he says something that we have to unpack for a second to make sense of. He talks about how Ephraim and Judah are going to get along. Ephraim and Judah. Ephraim is another way of talking about the northern kingdom, the t northern ten tribes, and Judah is the southern two tribes. And the north and the south have been fighting and bickering in a way that makes our own American Civil War look particularly low-key. Right? The north and the south have been bickering and fighting and backstabbing and attacking each other like only family can fight. Right? There isn't any worse family, uh, any fight than a family fight. And to say that Ephraim and Judah is good, are going to get along is more impressive than saying the lion and the lamb are going to lay down together. That is the peace towards which we are headed. That's the peace this king brings in that day. And to think about this peace for us, I can't give you an example, and I'm, I hesitate to ask because this is the type of peace that gets a little bit too personal, because here's what it is. Think of the two or three people who cause you the most heartache, the most frustration, the most tears, right? Think of the people who cause you the most pain. Are you related to them? Probably, <laughs> right? That's what this is talking about. Ephraim and Judah are going to get along again. The person who you're thinking of, you and them, can get along with it again. That's the peace we're, we're talking about. And what would it take to bring this about? An act of God? Well, yeah. That's the point. Exactly. It is the point that Isaiah is getting at. Humanity has tried, right? And when humanity tries, it can do some good things. But God can do some great things. Humanity can build a toilet, but it forgets, right? Humanity can have a Davidic king, but it falls. It takes an act of God to bring the king back to life, to, to bring the king, kingship back to life. It takes an act of God to bring this, this peace. And, and that's what we're waiting for during Advent. Advent is the time we, we are waiting. Right? Advent, that's what it, we're waiting for God to come to us. And, and it's a profound type of waiting that's more than like just waiting for your cases to get done with your pizza or waiting for your TV show to come on. We're waiting for something that matters. We're waiting for something important. We're waiting for peace. And we're waiting for something that we cannot do ourselves. We, we can't. We've tried. We've failed, right? We cannot do this ourselves. We cannot count on ourselves to always be getting better we just sometimes have to wait on God. And, and that's the hardest part for me of Advent, right? Because I want to do something, right? The very name of our tradition, the Methodist tradition, talks about methods, and methods are things you do. I want to do things, right? I want to have a to-do list and write it down, scratch it off, because I've done something. And Advent is the time when you wait. Not on what you can do, but on what God is going to do. Right? That is why we can look to tomorrow with hope. We look to tomorrow with hope because while we can't bring trees back to life, God can. And what we are waiting for and what we are hoping for is not that by some supreme effort we can build something immortal that will last forever. What we're waiting for is that God will come again to make peace when the Prince of Peace comes in final victory. And, and so I want to end with two very simple and short questions. Will there be toilets in heaven? I don't know. I truly don't know. If there are toilets in heaven, it will not be because we are clever, but because God is good. More importantly, second question, will you be at peace with everyone else who follows Jesus, 
even the ones that drive you up the wall? Yes. That's what's fascinating about heaven. You hear people ask, think about like, who are you going to be surprised to see in heaven? That's not what I find fascinating. What I find fascinating about heaven is that by the grace of God, by the power of God, I will be as excited to see everyone else in heaven as I will be to see my family and the people I love most. That's what heaven means, to be at such peace with everyone who follows Jesus that you are as happy to see your, ho- your spouse, your husband, your wife, your children, as you are to see the person who fo- also follows Jesus who has annoyed you most in life. Isn't that a powerful thing to hold on to? That's what we're waiting on.